Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for being here tonight for our HMSC Science on Tap. My name is Cinnamon Moffat, and I'm the Research Program Manager here at Oregon State University's Hatfield Marine Science Center. And we are located in Newport, Oregon, which you all know if you're in the room. But just a reminder that this is a hybrid event. So we have a lot of folks that have joined us online as well. So those folks that are online, just letting you know, we have turned off your mics, cameras, and screen shares. But we do hope that you ask us questions using the chat function or if you have any issues you can use that chat function and our volunteer Roseanne who's in the room here today um, will help navigate those troubles and we'll read out any questions for tonight's speaker. For folks in the room because we are a hybrid event I ask that if you have a question that you either raise your hand or go to the mic stand that's over on the side of the room and ask your question into the mic so that folks online can participate with us as well. Um, but again, thank you so much for being here. We're very excited for tonight's talk. I wanted to make a quick announcement um, that we do these seminars every month. They change depending on um, the speaker's availability on what night of the week. Um, but next month, we have Megan Wingrove, who's going to come and talk with the team about taking measurements at the face of an actively calving glacier. Um, and I'm really excited. I think we're going to have some really dynamic photos um, for that particular adventure. So uh, that particular talk is going to be on March 20th. Uh, same place, same time, just a different date. So I hope you can join us for that. Um, but I'm going to get right to the point so that we have as much time with our speaker for today. Um, today's speaker is Suzanne Brander. She received her PhD in toxicology and pharmac pharmacology um, at UC Davis in 2011. She took a uh, faculty position at the University of North Carolina in Wilmington. Um, and now she is an associate professor with the College of Agricultural Sciences at Oregon State University here at Hatfield. Um, her research focuses on the effects of stressors such as pollutants, microplastics, and climate change on aquatic organisms. Brander has served on a board of directors for the Society of Environmental Toxicology and Chemistry, North America, um, and is a member of the Green Ribbon Science Panel Advisory Team for the California Department of Toxic Substances and Control, and is a, um, on the Science Coalition for the UNEP Global Plastic Treaties and Negotiation, and we are just thrilled to have her here with us to talk. So I'm going to hand this off to Suzanne. Go ahead. Thank you so much, Cinnamon, for that introduction. Can everyone hear me? Wonderful. And thank you to everyone um, who came uh, tonight for the presentation. Like Cinnamon said, I'm going to be talking about plastics in the environment. We're mostly going to focus on Oregon and studies that we've done either in the lab here at Hatfield, where my group um, does their work, or off the coast of Oregon. But I'm going to finish um, by talking about some of the bigger implications. Um, but before I get started, I actually have a little assignment for the audience if you choose to participate. So something I'm going to talk about tonight are microfibers. And these are tiny little fibers that you sometimes can't even see that shed from your clothing. And for an outreach activity we were doing at the visitor center, we were having people take small pieces of tape and touch their clothing three or four times and put it on a board and write what their clothing was made of. So we're gonna do a little bit of a data collection for fun. Um, so, and don't worry if you can't figure out what your clothing is made of, but if your neighbor is willing to look at your tag in the back, that kind of helps. So just, just a fun thing to keep you entertained during the next, the next 45 minutes and we'll see, we'll see what we get at the end. Um, so a little bit of data collection. But all that being said, before I get started with my talk, I just wanted to say thank you to so many people, some of whom are not pictured here because we have new folks in the lab, but just to say that all of the different projects and data I'm going to talk about tonight weren't just collected by me. We have a, a, a big team of, of awesome students and staff and collaborators um, on campus like Dr. Stacy Harper, Dr. Chris Langdon, um, and people outside of OSU like Wayne Landis at Western Washington University, as well as Elise Granick at Portland State University. So definitely takes, takes a village um, and lots of um, funding support too 
So tonight I'm going to start out talking a bit about sources and exposure, just to kind of put this into context. So it's something I think about probably too much, but I want to make sure everyone's on the same page before I launch into um, talking about studies and kind of nittier, grittier details. To talk a bit about effects on organisms, which is mostly what our group focuses on, and a little bit about what the implications are for humans. What are the implications for us? And that's still a bit of a black box, but we're starting to understand that more and more. Um, and then we'll end on what I like to think of as more of a positive note, because some of this isn't going to be fun stuff to hear, but at the end, I'm gonna talk about mitigation strategies, some of which um, Oregon Sea Grant is now funding. We've started some studies to look at different things we can put into place to reduce the number of microplastics and fibers that are getting into our coastal areas. And I'll also talk a little bit about the UN plastics treaty negotiations, which have been ongoing for about the past year and a half. And there's going to be another meeting in Canada this April. So there are some definitely some positive movements, um, both regionally and globally. But to get to the description of the problem, and this is a slightly older data set, but the newer data sets are, are similar. And I like how this chart kind of lays things out. We're making a lot of plastic. Lots of different sectors are responsible for this plastic production. The two biggest ones currently are packaging. If you've received a box from Amazon lately, you know that they like to wrap every little book and anything that's not breakable even in, in bubble wrap. So that's not a surprise. Textiles are sometimes a category that people don't think of immediately, but that's the second largest source overall um, in terms of where plastic waste is coming from, so polyester. But if you look at where the ocean microplastics are coming from, the thinking is that synthetic textiles are actually the biggest category. Um, and then coming in second are car tires. Um, and some of you have probably heard the story about um, salmonids being affected by chemicals that are used to prolong the life of car tires. So those, those are concerning categories, but not always the things you think of, right? We're not finding pieces of plastic bottles everywhere as the top category. We're finding textiles and car tires. And the other thing I want to emphasize here is that, of course, this isn't just about the ocean. Um, I often will get asked to talk about marine plastics or ocean plastics. And the thing is that there are probably far more plastics inland in terrestrial areas. Um, there was a study that came out a couple of weeks ago where um, a group from the Ocean Conservancy and University of Toronto looked at protein sources across um, different kinds of meats, plant-based fish, and everything contained roughly the same amount, same background level of microparticles or microfibers. And the agriculture industry is a big contributor, for example, so all of that packaging, the mulch that's used on fields, that all, that all can break down into smaller pieces. So while we tend to think of this as an ocean or even as an aquatic problem, the reason we think of it that way is because that's where it was first discovered. You know, we discovered that the um, North Pacific gyre, that there was an ocean, a patch of garbage there, and it's more of a soup than like a thing you can walk across. But that was where we first became deeply aware of the problem, but they're really found everywhere we look um, from farm to table. And so how do we deal with this? We know and we've come to kind of a, a difficult you know, realization that we're not doing a great job with plastics. It really, until, until about 2016 or 2017, we thought we were recycling, right? We thought we were getting rid of at least a portion of our plastics and we were responsibly um, using them to regenerate new products, for example. But it turns out that globally, we recycle a pretty small percentage of our plastics, on average about 9%. And in the US, unfortunately, it's only about 4% of plastics. And this is something that is, is hard to swallow. It was hard for me when I learned this because of course, I grew up in the 80s and 90s and was about 12 or 13 when this article would have come out. And of course, recycling was the big 
buzz back then. Oh, if you just recycle, we're going to save the earth. And of course, I was probably really annoying because I became the recycling czar in my house and was telling my parents where to put where to put their cans and such. But it turns out that a lot of the buzz around recycling was really pushed by the plastics industry and all of those circled arrows that you see on the bottom of plastic products, we now know that it doesn't mean you can recycle it, right? It's just a symbol that identifies what type of plastic it is. And what you can and can't recycle has become really complicated, especially since we know that a lot of what we thought was being recycled was really just being shipped overseas to countries that, that were going to have to deal with it. Um, and it was piling up. But we still are kind of under this impression, and you can tell by the recycling bin and trash can that's in my office here, that we think we're recycling most of what we throw out. The, the green side and the black side should probably be, be switched to reflect reality. But, so what does this mean? Well, it means that we have a lot of plastics going into landfills. We have a lot of plastics that are blowing out of landfills, being improperly disposed of, and those plastics break down. And plastics are capable of continuing to break down for, depending on the type, potentially for hundreds of years, at least for decades, even if it's a bioplastic. And that means that we're being exposed. We use so many plastic products on a daily basis, and those plastic products break down and release sometimes on the order of thousands to millions of particles. And that's on the micro size. Um, there was a study that came out uh, about a month ago looking at nanoplastics in bottled water. And of course, those particles, because they're much smaller, there are orders of magnitude more of particles of those smaller, less than one micron sizes. So it's so small that you would need a scanning electron microscope to see it. Um, so. Bottle caps are a source of exposure. Tires are a big source. Even things like baby bottles tend to shed particles. Um, and we found these in, in various types of tissues, everywhere from the placenta to meconium um, and um, infant, infant stool samples. And indications are that these microplastics have kind of subtle longer term effects, so they can cause alterations to the microbiome, or they can lead to inflammation. But those are all studies that need to be repeated and dug into deeper because we really mostly have data on um, aquatic organisms at this point. But just to kind of highlight the problem a little bit more, uh, fibers, for example, which were one of the bigger categories listed on that chart of microplastic sources, they've been found in tap water globally, um, including the US. In the US, we were at about 94%, so a little bit higher than some of the other, um, other regions of the world and other countries. And fibers have become much more of a challenge than we initially thought they would be. So, and this is fibers of natural and anthropogenic origin. They've been found in biota, they're found in water and sediment, and really just globally distributed. Um, they've even been found up in the Arctic Circle. And the source of those fibers up in the Ar Arctic Circle was traced back to washers and dryers in North America. So there, there's, a lot, there's a lot of work to be done. And I'll talk a little bit about why fibers are concerning. And then lastly, just to kind of put the challenge into context, of course, you know, climate change is the elephant in the room and the other big environmental stressor here. And because with climate change, we're seeing more storms, we're seeing more wildfires, that's changing where pollution is showing up and how it can be transported globally and, and regionally. Um, and this is a term that I just learned a couple of months ago, but that the new term for plastics that are melted from wildfires are pyroplastics. And so this includes things that melt and mix with natural materials. And so those aren't rocks. They actually are comprised of a bit of plastic too, but you wouldn't know that unless you analyze them. And then a lot of our pipes are made from PVC. Well, those tend to melt in fires. And so you release the chemicals and the plastics um, in the process. And so just lots of things 
that we don't necessarily think about on a day-to-day -day basis that we need to rethink now that we're facing increase in population, increase in plastic production, as well as um, climate change being a big factor here. And another way to think about it, and I think someone, I'm um, forgetting who I'm quoting here, but someone on social media a couple of years ago said that plastics are climate change in solid form. That's not exactly technically correct, but, but it was getting at this challenge, and that's that plastic production is inherently linked to climate change in some ways because plastics are made, at least traditional plastics, are made from fossil fuels. And another thing that is happening now is that the fossil fuel industry is kind of looking at, looking at the future and saying, well, we're going to lose revenue because more people are buying electric cars. And so we're not making as much money from selling gas to fuel vehicles. So what do we do? Well, they're getting into plastics. And so plastics are quote unquote, kind of the plan B for the fossil fuel industry. And so they're building more plants, they're setting up, they're actually getting natural gas from fracking. All these things are happening in the US and, and elsewhere. And it's something that is being discussed quite a bit at the UN right now um, in those um, plastic treaty negotiations I mentioned. So getting back to microplastics and, and the challenge at hand, now that we kind of have the, the, current, the current global situation, um, you know, we're, we're in that, in that frame, of, frame of thinking, you know, it's, it's difficult to wrap your mind around how truly tiny some of these particles are. And today I'm just focusing on microplastics. And the definition of a microplastic is a plastic that is less than five millimeters in size. But frankly, and, and students and, and folks in my lab will tell you this, most of what we find in our samples in fish or sediment or water are far, far tinier, you know, on average, maybe between 100 microns and 500 microns, so half a millimeter and smaller, so really tiny. And what I'm showing here is an, is an organism we worked with when I was in North Carolina, um, which kind of kicked off a lot of the research that we do now on smaller organisms. And this is a single-celled tintinnate ciliate that is common in freshwater and marine habitats, sped upon by you know, small organisms like copepods, larval fish. And they use these cilia to drag in particles um, that, they, that they feed on. They readily take up plastic particles that are about 10 to 20 microns in size. And then those particles can be transferred up the food web. So what we found was that larval fish will ingest more plastic particles from prey like this than they will directly from the water. So, so the animals that are internalizing these particles, they aren't necessarily ingesting them on purpose, but often it's from a prey item or it's from inhaling something accidentally. So just, just to kind of put it in context, it's, we're talking about things that you can really only see sometimes with a microscope. And so it's hard to convey the, um, the complexity and the, the magnitude of the problem sometimes. So what do we know about microplastic impacts? Um, and again, most of what we know is from aquatic organisms, marine organisms, freshwater organisms, because really that's where the research started. And that's where most of the funding has been up until even a couple of years ago. Um, it was hard to get funding for studies, um, terrestrial studies. But we know from studies with aquatic organisms that the size and shape of particles are really important. So for a while, people were, you know, when they would do a microplastic study, they would get their particles online from Thermo Fisher or some um, biological sciences company, and you'd get these perfect little spheres in a jar that you would then do, set up your experiment with. You, know, you would feed them to fish or, you know, little, little copepods in the lab. But it turns out that none of the environmental particles are perfect spheres. I don't think I've ever found a perfect sphere inside of a fish. And that's important because it turns out that the particles that are more jagged or fragmented, or fibers in particular, 
tend to do more damage internally um, and also tend to be harder to um, eliminate. Um, and so, you know, I'm talking about this in the context of animals that are that are tiny, you know, maybe a couple of millimeters long. Um, but because that's what most of the studies have been done in. And these particles are big enough and they reside in the GI tract long enough that they can cause something called food dilution. Um, and what food dilution means is that you're basically not getting as much nutrition as you need to be. So you're ingesting synthetic particles or foreign particles, and that's taking up space in your gut and sending your brain a signal that you're full. Well, you're not gonna get any calories from a piece of polyester fiber, right? And so what we found consistently and what others have found is that when you expose animals, especially in early life, to these particles, to fibers, um, to other plastics, they tend to have reduced growth. And that has big implications over the long term for an animal that's going to be living and surviving, you know, and avoiding predators and trying to, you know, reproduce and all those things can potentially be impacted. And again, what's covered up here is that most studies still use these purchase particles, but we're moving slowly into other types. And the other overwhelming thing here is that there are so many different combinations of microplastic or polymer types and chemicals and sizes and shapes. I mean, you could spend your lifetime, you know, trying to cover, cover all of them, right? And so what a lot of um, labs are doing is they're designing these high throughput studies where they're using small organisms, they're doing replicates in, in small, you know, well plates or beakers to try to really get through lots of different plastic types. And it's not necessarily the most realistic, but um, it's, a, it's a strategy to be able to get, get to the plastic types that are really potentially more harmful. And what's come out of a lot of research like this are that things like microfibers and tire particles seem to be some of the more um, potentially hazardous categories. And what I'm showing here, this is a video from our lab. We have a chamber where we measure behavioral responses of larval fish to different stressors, including plastics. And so those tiny little dots swimming around in those wells are larval fish that are about four days old. So they're maybe two, three millimeters long. They're cute when you can see them up close, but kind of hard to see what's going on there. So something we do here, um, and this is in collaboration with my colleague, uh, Dr. Stacy Harper at Oregon State at, at, at Maine campus, is we make our own particles on site. And so the, we've started with everything from tires to plastic bottles to straws, um, both bio-based and traditional. Um, as well as, you know, picking up a, a piece of polyester from Joanne's fabrics and shredding it down to microfiber size. Um, but try, what the attempt here is to try to make our experiments as realistic as possible. Um, and we do our work in early life stages of either freshwater fish on campus or marine organisms here um, in my lab at Hatfield. And that's what a lot of labs are doing. They're using cryomilling to create smaller particles from actual plastic products, or you know, using a combination of microtome and very finite razor cutting to make microfibers for experiments. So basically half of our work is making particles to set up experiments in the lab, and the other half is detecting them in samples that we get from the field. So we're kind of coming at it from, from both sides here. I'm just gonna show you a couple of examples of, of data that we've collected um, in these experiments. And typically what we'll do is do a four day exposure with larval fish or juvenile invertebrates. Um, we'll feed them relatively low concentrations of particles and then see how they respond at the end of those, those 96 hours. And what you can see here, and this is an experiment that we did with polypropylene. So it's used to make straws, yogurt containers, centrifuge tubes, um, lots of different things. You can't really typically recycle it um, anymore. So 
what we see is that there are effects on growth starting at about 50 particles per mil. And that's probably a bit higher than what they would be exposed to in the environment, but it gives us an understanding of kind of how much is too much. And we can understand what the dose response is, which is really important if you're trying to figure out how to regulate something, right? Um, and so we see effects on growth um, with traditional straws, both at the micro size and we also tested the nano size. And we compared this to compostable straws. So I'm sure you've all seen these green straws that say compostable and you know all caps on the side that you can get are the cups. They're all made out of a poly, this polylactic, um, or sorry, polyacetic acid. And we did an exposure um, at the same concentrations and basically found that both particle types, the traditional polypropylene and the bioplastic, the PLA, caused similar responses, right? In fact, with the bio-based plastics, nanoplastics were a little bit worse. So on one hand, bioplastics are good because they uh, aren't using fossil fuels. They can potentially be compostable at the right conditions. But from the perspective of a larval fish, something that still takes five or 10 years to break down, if you're only living for a year and a half, it doesn't really matter, right? It's still a microplastic that you can take up and that can affect you. So we've also done a lot of work on textiles. Um, and a student who, uh, or postdoc who finished up a couple of years ago, um, Dr. Samreen Siddiqui, did an experiment where she exposed juvenile shrimp and fish, and I'm just showing the shrimp data here, to cotton, um, polyester, uh, and polypropylene. And the polyester, of course, is a common textile used in clothing. Cotton is as well, and then polypropylene is used pretty commonly in um, like ropes that are used in marine settings, fishing settings. And what she found was that all three, at least in the shrimp, impacted their growth. It didn't matter if it was cotton or polypropylene or polyester. What mattered was that it was a fiber taking up space in that organism's stomach. And the cotton was persistent enough that it had a similar effect. So, so really the issue here isn't necessarily, we need to switch from polyester to this or from cotton to this. We need to reduce the amount of material pollution that's getting into the environment overall. What was interesting is that this seems to be species specific and the fish were not impacted by the cotton. So there are some organisms that can break down the cotton, but there are some that can't. So that was surprising. We were thinking of cotton as being a control, but then it ended up affecting some of the animals. Um, and so doing some further studies with the same mycid shrimp, which is not um, an Oregon mycid shrimp, um, but is uh, considered a representative species that's used throughout the US for um, testing of effluent um, by the EPA. So another student uh, who came to work for the summer a couple of years ago from UC Davis compared cotton to nylon polyester, and he also added hemp in there and had some interesting results with this comparison as well. He was looking at the, how the shrimp were reacting in terms of stress. And so he measured something called reactive oxygen species. And those are molecules that are produced in the cells of us, basically of, of, of any <laughs> multicellular organism who's under stress. Um, and so you're able to measure those to get an indication of how the animal is responding to its environment. And what he found was not surprisingly that as he increased the temperature while he was exposing them to microfibers, the cellular stress increased. But he saw the highest amount of cellular stress in the polyester and the hemp, um, which is kind of the opposite of what we were expecting. He also saw it in nylon and then cotton at that higher temperature actually started to degrade. And so starting to think about these potential interactions between being exposed to warmer temperatures and being exposed to a microplastic or a microfiber. And the shrimp seem to be fairly sensitive, potentially more sensitive than, than the fish that we work with. 
But kind of continuing that, that story with microfibers, um, we've also found that even over longer term exposures, so we've done some exposures with fish that go for about 21 days, so three weeks. It's kind of a standard length for a toxicity test. Um, what we found in this experiment was that only the new microfibers, and these were polyester, caused a reduction in growth across that longer time period. So what we're finding here is that as the organisms get older, they maybe become less sensitive to that food dilution problem, to that, that effect on their, on their size, but it still might affect them if it's a particular type of particle. And then I'm not going to show the data, but we saw all sorts of changes in gene expression and other like behavioral effects. And so this is just kind of scratching the surface here, but it seems that fibers are often the, the best at causing that food dilution effect. And we think it's because it's just really hard to get rid of them once, once, they're, in, once they're in the digestive tract, right? And what about mammals? Just kind of putting some weird spaces between the B and the zero, but or the B and the O, but that's okay. I don't do a lot of work with mammals, but we have had some really great opportunities at OSU to collaborate with labs that work with mice and rats. And so a few years ago, we were able to do a study with a group that works with mice. And we also collaborated with a group that studies effects on the microbiome. Um, this is Tom Sharpton's lab, if anyone, if anyone is familiar with his work. And what we wanted to see was if particles in the drinking water of these mice impacted their microbiome over a short time period. And so we put nanoparticles in the treatment group, none in the control group, of course, and exposed them for 24 hours. And what we found was that at the end of those 24 hours, the bacteria, bacterial diversity differed between the controls and the exposed mice. And so that's kind of where the human health research is headed at this point. We're getting these hints from um, studies in zebrafish, studies in, um, in mammalian models like mice and rodents, that there are these subtle long-term effects such as impacts on the microbiome. Different bacteria are going to preferentially grow in plastics than they are in the absence of plastics. And that's really what's causing differences like this to pop up. And that might have big implications for us because the microbiome controls so many biological functions. So something, something to keep an eye out for in terms of um, potential human health impacts. So kind of the other half of our work, and I, I might have to speed through some of these slides, is looking at where microplastics are showing up. How much is out there? What's out there? And of course, it feels like every week there's a study that comes out that says, we found microplastics in this, we found microplastics in that, but we still haven't done enough work to understand, to fully understand exposure. And we can only understand how hazardous microplastics are when we understand both exposure and effect and responses. So we do a lot of um, processing of different samples, which includes isolating, digesting, um, measuring, and then spectroscopy to verify what the material is. So we don't just pull a plastic out of a fish and say, well, it looks like plastic, you know, let's check that one off. We have um, an FTIR instrument that is able to identify that material by generating a spectra, which we can then compare back to a library of known materials. So folks in our group spend a lot of time looking through a microscope at something like, like this. And this is a, a picture taken by um, Alexa, who is a faculty research assistant um, and lab manager with us. And this is from a study that we are uh, doing in collaboration with a group down in Southern California that's trying to standardize methods for measuring microplastics. So even though it feels like we've been talking about this for a decade or so now, the microplastics research field is still relatively young and 
for other pollutants like pesticides, things that are soluble, there are all sorts of standardized methods that scientists follow globally. And the reason for that is that you wanna be able to compare data from Europe to data from the US or Canada or, or wherever. But the problem with microplastics is that everyone's kind of figuring it out, you know, and you can't necessarily compare those data. So in California, they have funding to send samples that are spiked to different labs, and then we're able to send our data back to tell them what we found, and they can compare um, how you know similar our results were. So, you know, what we're looking at here is you've got that green sphere, which clearly was spiked in there because you would never see that in an actual sample. A couple things that look like tire particles. You've got this little pink particle down here that's actually a piece of shell from a shellfish. So we spend a lot of time trying to differentiate things that might be plastic from things that are natural. Um, and I think we've got a piece of a water bottle up there too. But this is a lot of this is a lot of really kind of painstaking, detail-oriented work, and it takes a lot of time to process samples for that reason. So part of the reason for the study looking at how different labs are processing samples is to standardize methods, but it's also to try to come up with ways to make this more efficient. So you're not spending all day on one on one or two samples, right? And then of course we have all sorts of other measures in place to make sure we're not shedding particles into our samples. So all of this work happens in a lab with laminar flow hoods. So all of the samples are processed under a HEPA filter. Um, everyone wears these lovely stylish orange lab coats because that way we know if we shed something from our lab coat and it's orange, we know that came from us and isn't from the sample itself. Whereas you wouldn't know that necessarily if it was just a white lab coat. But getting into some of the representative studies that we've done, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about a black rockfish study that we published um, last year, and then a study that we did in collaboration with the GEM lab here at Hatfield um, on Pacific gray whales and their prey. Right, So iconic species that even has its own license plate there. But what we found in Oregon rockfish, and this study focused on marine reserves primarily. And we had two different sources of rockfish. One were, um, they were basically pre-adults, they were almost adult, caught from Cape Falcon, Cascade Head, uh, Cape Perpetua and Redfish Rocks, and then with Newport as a comparison. And then we had larval rockfish um, that had settled um, in from Otter Rock, Cape Fellweather, and uh, that should have a location on there. It says unknown, so, but Oregon coast. And what we found, you know, not surprisingly, was that it was mostly fibers, especially in the larval fish with some fragments. And that, you know, not surprisingly, marine reserves aren't keeping the pollutants out, right, including microplastics. So we found fibers and, and um, microplastics across all of those samples. And then we've also had a chance to look in other fish species. So recently, um, Olivia Boisson, who is a master's student in fisheries and wildlife, finished us up a study on mctophids. And she was getting mctophids from historically caught NOAA samples, as well as samples that she was able to get from museums, from Scripps and from uh, UW. And I'm not showing all of the data here because I don't have enough time, but she saw some interesting trends across fish that were caught from the 1960s up until about 2015 with a slight increase in microplastic content in their guts as you advanced in time. And then in the fish that were caught off the Oregon and Washington coast, again, she found mostly fibers um, and approximately 30% of the fish contained, contained those. We've also had some really fun opportunities to collaborate with um, through NOAA on this uh, International Year of the Salmon Cruise that happened in, I believe it was the end of 2022. I'm losing track of time here. But here we also looked at mctophids and had a chance to look at squid as well that were caught on those cruises. And not surprisingly, we found particles in both the mctophids and the squid. Interestingly, more in the squid than the mctophids. 
which indicated that maybe there was a chance that those particles were bioaccumulating, but we're not sure. But, but really the overall implications of finding particles in small fish species like mctophids is that their predators eat a lot of them, right? And so even if you're only finding a couple of fibers in 34% of the fish, if you've got something like a Pacific albacore that eats 1,600 metric tons of mctophids, um, you know, you're, you're looking at maybe more than 300 million particles per year, which, you know, kind of, kind of is mind blowing. And, and it's similar for large marine mammals too. So the study we did with the GEM lab um, and also with Kim Bernard and Sarah Hinkle um, here at OSU, we looked at the number of microparticles per species that are typically fed upon by Pacific gray whales. And so Pacific gray whales have kind of an interesting feeding strategy. It's this giant animal, but they basically dive into the benthos to acquire their prey. And so they're eating millions of these tiny little mysid shrimp um, and copepods on a daily basis. And of course, the GEM lab has great data on how many exactly they eat. They had data on what pregnant and lactating Pacific gray whales were eating. So we did the work with the tiny, the tiny uh, mysid shrimp, um, and they were going out and sampling uh, whale feces and, and trying to get an idea of what, what the whales were eating. And of course, we found fibers. But the, the big story here is that if you look at what a whale typically ingests and you match that with the average amount of microfibers that were contained in those different species that are typically ingested by whales, you can see that you might have a situation, depending on the species and the state of the whale, whether it's pregnant or lactating, they could be ingesting up to 21 million particles per day. What does that mean? We don't know, but what it makes me think of is the microbiome study or studies on inflammation. What is the long-term impact on these longer lived organisms that are exposed to such high volumes of microplastics from their prey um, on a daily basis? So we're continuing this study now by actually um, capturing wild mycids from the coast, which has been a bit of an adventure, um, but this is in collaboration with the GEM lab. So they bring back Oregon mycids and we try to keep them happy in the lab. And we were finally successful with that this past summer and did a feeding study with microfibers. And so the plan is to use those samples to look at things like cellular stress and effects on growth and all of the things we've been doing with the model organisms that aren't native to Oregon we're gonna to try to do with this native Oregon mycid. So we're getting there. But lastly, just wanted to mention a couple of other collaborative studies. We're also collaborating with the Big Fish Lab and they have a study on salmon sharks and they're taking some of those salmon shark guts and we're analyzing those in the lab. And this is an early result, but you, know, you can see that they're classifying the different particle types they're finding. And I think they found about 26 particles in the first stomach that they analyzed. And it's, it's kind of mind blowing to see how gigantic these stomachs are. The one they brought in was like basketball shaped. So when you're used to working with animals that are about this big and someone brings a stomach in that's like this, it's, you know, it's a little bit jarring, but, um, but they're handling it. Yeah. And then collaborations with other labs include studies like this where we've looked across a number of different species. And a lot of times we get a little bit of pushback about the studies in fish because people will say, well, we're not eating the stomachs. So why does it matter if you find microplastics in the stomachs? Well, the microplastics move. If they're small enough, they can move from the gut to other parts of the body. And so what the Granite Lab at Portland State has found is that in most species of fish that we get from market, or grocery stores that you find the fibers and other smaller particles in the fillets too. And so it agrees with that study that came out a couple of weeks ago, looking at a bunch of different um, protein sources. You know, and so, I mean, the big take home message here is that this is a really complex 
task and really time intensive, and it takes a lot of time to really correctly identify these particles and to figure out what's going on, to figure out what organisms are being exposed to. And so this is just an example of a spectra that we get from our, our FTIR when we're looking at these materials. You know, and sometimes you find, find things that you, you don't even necessarily think of as plastic. Like I was talking to a group the other day and they said, oh, well, coffee cups are recyclable, right? It's like, no, if you take the paper layer off, that's what it looks like inside. And we have found evidence of pieces of those cups in some of our fish. The lining of it, at least, is, is polyethylene, right? And then, of course, we're expanding into territories that I never thought I would get into, but we're also now looking at biosolids because everything that we send to the wastewater treatment plant can end up in the sludge, can end up in the effluent that is then used as fertilizer or discharged back into waterways. And so we're finding, again, a lot of microfibers in these samples. And these are just things we need to think about how to deal with. How do we regulate it? How do we upgrade wastewater treatment plants so they can handle um, some of these materials and keeping them out of our out of the environment right to, so to sum this up over the short term we really see consistent effects of, on growth and behavior and it doesn't always matter what the material is it's the fact that it's there it seems like it depends a lot on the shape and the size and so it's not necessarily dependent on polymer type. And over the time, over the longer, longer time periods, fibers seem to have more impacts. And it seems that low levels of ingestion in zooplankton, so either small forage fish or copepods, mycid shrimp, can translate into pretty large microplastics exposures for the predator, depending on that predator's dietary needs. Right. And Oregon biosolids, you know, in addition to all of the other samples we looked at, contain a variety of different types of particles. So not a shocker in that that study is ongoing. But what I wanted to finish up with was sort of on a positive note, some of the work that we're doing now that's more focused on mitigation. So we know this is a problem. We know it's everywhere we look. We know it's causing effects. Why don't we figure out how to fix it? And of course, that's going to take a lot of time and a lot of people and funding and regulation and all those other things. But Oregon Sea Grant has recently funded a collaborative study between Portland State University, OSU, and University of Portland, where we're going to be working with several coastal cities and helping people put things like washing machine filters on their, in their, on their laundry units so they can actually start capturing microfibers instead of releasing them into the environment. And this study has already been done in a small Canadian town. And what they showed was that installing filters on just 10% of homes significantly reduced microfiber loading into waterways. It significantly reduced what was getting into the effluent and into the sludge. So you're handling it and throwing those fibers in the trash before they get out to the wastewater treatment plant. So there have been bills proposing that we do this on a larger basis, but of course there's been pushback from industry on that. And so the plan here is to provide solid data, both on putting filters on washing machines, right? As well as using stormwater catchments in those towns. So we'll be looking at this from two different angles. What are we removing from the stormwater and what are we able to remove from gray water that's coming from people's homes. So those solutions, those, those investigations are in process. And of course, there are lots of other potential solutions. We know, you know, if you've been to a grocery store, you know that bio-based and biodegradable plastics, at least as advertised, are everywhere. But of course, it's complicated because you know, we get all these PLA cups in Oregon, but you can't compost them. We don't have an industrial facility. So we sort of in some ways have put the cart before the horse because we figured out how to make all these bio-based plastics, which are probably better over the long run, but we don't necessarily have a way to deal with them yet. So that's, that's a complicated issue that's um, 
that's slowly being resolved. And the thing with bio-based plastics, and sorry, the font's a little bit messed up here, is that the rate at which they degrade is really going to be dependent on the product type and the environment. Is it cold or is it warm, right? Something's going to break down a lot faster in the sediment or in, you know, in a compost facility in Florida where it's really warm potentially than it would here. And so you have, for example, um, biodegradable mulches that are being advertised to farmers, but they're going to work, work really well in the tropics, but not so well where it's cold for nine months out of the year. And recycling is another issue that has mechanical recycling, at least, has been an issue for a long time. We still only recycle about 4% of our plastics here in the US, 9% globally. And so the suggested solution to this is something called chemical recycling. And that's become a really hot topic. And so plants have been popping up. I think there's one in Tigard that promised that they're gonna be able to take any type of plastic and melt it down, pyrolyze it and produce new plastics, produced fuel, produce, you know, make it, make it reusable again. And so they're advertising that they can recycle all of these different plastic types. But the problem is that plastics use thousands of different types of chemicals to make them look the way they look, to make them function the way they function. So to make them flexible or rigid, for example. And no one's talking about that issue because if you make fuel, out of something like polystyrene, it's gonna volatilize all those chemicals. And so that's something that's another area of research because maybe this is a potential solution, but the trick is that you need to think about all of the potential impacts too before you implement it. And that's what they're trying to do at the UN right now, which they've, they've tackled, they've proposed to tackle a giant, a giant problem here, right? And so the Plastics Treaty, which is under negotiation, came out of an agreement that was put into place back in March 2022. And so this is the year that delegates held their first negotiating session. Um, and there have been a couple of others that have followed since. And you can imagine that this is a really difficult problem to A, wrap your head around and B, to get agreement on because we're talking about people coming from different countries with different access to resources, industry is there, NGOs, and it's it's really a, a pretty a pretty heated discussion is what I've heard from people who have been able, scientists who have been able to attend. But there is a group of us called the Scientist Coalition that has come together to advise the delegates to the treaty. And so this is just an example of one of the documents that we've produced, but the information we're putting forward is meant to be research-based, science-based, you know, the, the newest information that delegates might not necessarily be aware of. And it's meant to convey that there are challenges across the entire life cycle of plastic. And so we put out a lot of briefs and, you know, short, short documents to educate the delegates so then they can hopefully make the best decisions going forward. And this is something that will probably play out for the next year, but you know, to put it in context, it's really pretty exciting that you know, this much um, momentum has been generated from really only about 15 or so years of research. You know, as someone who's been working on pesticides for longer than that, right? We've already gotten to this point. So it'll, it'll still be, there will still be a lot of debate, but at least, at least we're talking about it. But gonna finish up here and just say um, that, you know, if it hasn't, hasn't come across already, we definitely need systemic change. This isn't, it's great to see all of the new options in terms of um, products that are reusable or refillable and all of the things that we can potentially use in our homes to reduce our footprint. But a lot of those options are really expensive and not available to a large percentage of the public or they take time to implement. And really what we need is change from the top. We need industry to change, to offer us better options. And here you're seeing business as usual going up, up, up. And really the only 
option to reducing our plastics footprint is, is complete change. And you know, you're starting to see evidence of that change. I mean, there are scientists who do something called life cycle analysis and they compare the pollution footprint and carbon footprint of different products. And as a result of that, you're seeing, you know, instead of bottled water, you're seeing water coming in aluminum cans. Um, so I don't know if you've seen this in a grocery store, it is water, it's not alcohol. I tested it, um, but you know, it, it was really, I was excited to see this. And I think the clerk was a little confused as to why I was so excited, but water in an aluminum can, we, we recycle 60% of our aluminum compared to 4% of our plastic. So anyway, things to get excited about, but. I'm gonna finish up there. And I think we have a few minutes for questions. And again, just want to acknowledge all the incredibly hard work of um, folks in my group, students, staff, who just do an amazing job doing really detail-oriented, sometimes kind of excruciating, you know, staring in a microscope all day. So thank you to them. Um, some information if you're interested in joining our um, Pacific Northwest Consortium on Plastics. We hold regular interest group discussions on different topics. We have um, annual meetings as well. So thank you so much again for coming tonight and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so very much for sharing with us. We really appreciate it. I do want to open up to questions, but I wanted to let folks know if you're up against a time crunch, because I know we're uh, pushing it a little bit, feel free to exit out the back of the auditorium. There's some doors out there and you can come down that way. So that way you don't have to feel like you're walking right in front of all of us. Um, but yes, I would like to open up to questions. I want to start with question online. So Roseanne, do you have a question online? Uh, yeah. Can you comment? <laughs> Just Can you comment on the impact of fireworks on the beaches? They're already against state law, but those are poorly enforced. Uh, more cities are passing general bans. Would you be supportive of these? Yeah, and, and someone tipped me off that this might be a question during the happy hour. But, you know, I think in the long run, it's probably better if we don't use fireworks. I can relate to those who are frustrated to hear that we might no longer have fireworks. I mean, there's that sentimental value, right? The memories that you have of, of seeing fireworks shows. But I think the more we can do to reduce our use of things that are not necessary and are obvious potential impacts to the environment, the better. You know, it, I, I think it's important that we consider bans not just on the coast, where it's obvious that things would be getting into the ocean, but inland too, because those are eventually gonna, you know, pollute some ecosystem, it might be terrestrial or freshwater. Um, but but yeah, I think I would support a ban, even though I would miss the firework shows. Thank you. Okay, questions in the room. I got one down low. Uh, hi, just a comment and a question. Uh, today's Washington Post had an article about using AI in recycling plants to actually improve the selection and 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 the the, the strain and, and the stream and recover more plastic. That was an interesting article if you if you look at it. And the other the question I have is you mentioned that in some fish you'll find microplastics or nanoplastics in the tissue. Mm -hmm. Do you find those also in mammals? And do plants, agricultural plants, take up and and sequester microplastics? Really good questions. Um, translocation has been confirmed in fish and in mammals. It seems that in fish, slightly larger microplastics can tra translocate compared to mammals. In mammals, as far as I know, it has to be something that is under 10 microns in one dimension. But the thing with fibers is that at least you know, in the thin dimension, they're about 10 microns. And so you can think of kind of a spaghetti noodle going through a, you know, a membrane pore, and that's how they would get into a fillet or into other, into other tissues. So yeah, it can, it can happen in mammals as well. And that probably explains why we see, we, there have been studies that have shown microplastics and nanoplastics in the placenta and in the heart. And so, yeah, we, we might be partially made of plastic, unfortunately. Yeah. 
Don't think about that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, question online, Roseanne. Oh, plants, yes. The oh, nanoplastics sorry. can translate can translocate into plants. Microplastics seem to be too big, but they can alter the soil microbiome. So. All right, Roseanne, go Okay, ahead. what happens to the fibers and other materials captured in bioswales? Do they eventually become full? And where do the materials they've captured go? Yeah. It's a good question. I mean, both the bioswales and say a filter on your washing machine, as long as it's emptied regularly, you're not going to have an issue with with overflow um, or with you know getting into the environment anyway. But they're usually emptied into landfills, so it's slightly better, but not but not perfect. But at least it's not going to um, either a wastewater treatment plant that can't manage it or into the waterways directly but yeah all right questions in the room <laughs> my front row hi um the information about um laundry filters was interesting i was wondering if you have one on your laundry machine and how much do they cost? Mm -hmm. And are they readily available? And uh, also, are you familiar with guppy bags or guppy friend bags? Mm -hmm. And do they work? Because mm -hmm. I've been washing polyester clothes in a guppy bag. But now that I see that cotton is just as bad um, or even worse, should everything be washed in a guppy bag or have a filter on your machine? Yeah. The, uh, we do have a filter and it's the brand is Filtrol and it's about a hundred dollars. So it's not that much to install. And frankly, it hasn't been something that we have to dump out, you know, every day or every week. We go about three months maybe before we have to clean it. And I have two kids who are seven and 13 plus four cats. So we, we generate plenty of microfibers. And so far we haven't flooded our house. So it works pretty well. The guppy bag and there's another product called a Cora ball. They both work well, but not quite as well as a filter. So I think they reduce your fiber output by about 30%, whereas the filter will reduce it by about 80 to 90%. So it is slightly better. <laughs> yeah. If you're curious about those products, uh, both the guppy bag and the Cora ball are out on the table mm -hmm. out front. So yeah. if you haven't seen one of those. We have another question online. We'll take just another one from online and another in the room, and then we'll wrap up for tonight. Go ahead, Roseanne. Okay, given that plastic amounts keep growing, meaning that there are huge amounts yet to be broken down, do you have a sense if there's some critical mass or tipping points of background levels that will start to produce notable cascade effects or collapses in these various populations? Yeah. I mean, it's possible we're already seeing that happen at a slow rate. And, you know, if we stopped making plastic tomorrow, I mean, the person asking this question is right, that there's enough out there that it would continue to break down and enter the environment. But there has been a recommendation to aim to cap virgin plastic production by 2040 or 2050. And the thinking is that if we were able to cap at least a large portion of virgin plastic production by that point, we could then eventually over, you know, several decades start to see a reduction in in pollution levels. But it's a big, it's a big if and it's something that's being talked about um, at the the UN plastics treaty negotiations. Um, but but yeah, as far as a tipping point, you know, some scientists have suggested we're kind of already there and um, they call it that we're, we're at risk of, risk of exceeding plant, our planetary boundary for environmental stressors. And this is combining um, climate change with soluble pollutants and plastic pollution that we are at risk of, of reaching that tipping point if we don't cap our production in a decade or two. Yeah. Any other questions in the room? All right, hang on, let me get to you. <laughs> Dr. Brander, I know you don't like to attract undue attention from Big Tire, but 
since your research focuses on tire wear particles and mm -hmm. their impacts on some onads, do you have you talked to Big Tire? Have you talked to the industry as a researcher, just as an, an advisory role, or is there some environmental regulator who might be um, interested at EPA to approach that mm -hmm. industrial sector to start to talk about alternative preservatives and or reformulation that potentially EPA could help fund? Because I know that's going to be part of the conversation, but mm -hmm. it seems like if we know there's harm and you know the mechanism and the methodology for the harm, I guess the next step is getting friendly regulators or um, elected folks that would be uh, catch their ear. Mm -hmm. uh, just curious about that side of it. That's, that's a good question. And I will admit that that isn't something I've been heavily involved in, um, in terms, it's complicated, as you know, right? We, we have been able to, um, and when I say we, I mean myself and um, Stacy Harbor, Harper have had a collaboration where we've been able to get tire particles from the U.S. Tire Manufacturers Association. They actually sent us a mix of about six or seven different brands of U.S. made tires to do testing with in the lab. And those data aren't, aren't ready for, for prime time yet, but I have a student who's working on that um, with our, our model systems. But in terms of influencing regulation, I would say the EPA would be the go-to there. And the EPA in Corvallis is doing quite a bit of work on tires. Um, they're doing some work on catchments, looking at how they can reduce loading um, into local waterways, for example. So they might be a good place to start in terms of trying to push regulation forward. But I haven't, you know, there, there's, there's been some back and forth with um, the particles that we got. And I guess at first they were gonna be setting up these meetings for researchers to connect with people at the US Tire Manufacturers Association. And then that's kind of recently been, you know, put on hold. So, so I think the tire industry is um, a bit hesitant to collaborate too much at this point because they feel like they're, they're being targeted, you know, understandably for good reason. Um, but, but yeah, I do think that that issue has moved forward faster than a lot of other issues, the six PPD challenge. And so I, I'm optimistic that, you know, that will come up with some alternatives you know, maybe over the next couple of years, but, but that's not something I've really been focused on at this point, just kind of been on the fringe of that discussion. All right. As we wrap up, Dr. Brander, do you have anything you want to leave us with a, a thought, an idea? Uh, I guess just that a, a lot of what I've presented tonight is probably a little bit alarming, but there are discussions and serious discussions underway at the UN to try to improve the situation and to reduce the amount of pollution we're creating. And so I, I try to take that as you know, as a as a as a big plus, and try to be and trying to be optimistic, seeing those developments on the horizon. So, you know, if you get frustrated, just think about that instead. And be glad that you're not a delegate because those conversations must be really challenging. So, <laughs> All right. On that note, thank you so much. One more round of applause for tonight's speaker. Thank you. All right, everyone. Hope to see you next month, um, March 20th. And again, if you're curious about some of those products that are coming out, there's a table out there put up by the green team of Hatfield. And take a look. Thank you, everyone. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>
for folks online. We're going to be wrapping up. Thank you so much for being here.